let's bring in Justin Dunk, who, as we get real and forget about talking about the sim, he's been leading the charge CFL news this week. How you doing, Justin? Doing well, guys. What about you out there? Uh, we're doing okay, but I mean, you know, I told you how excellent your work has been at 3 downnationcom kind of telling the coach's side of things with the football operations cap, but things took a decidedly gloomy turn this week. And it, it, what you're saying is you're just reporting the reality, right? I mean, what's been the reaction to your reports of the latest between the league and its coaches and its players? There's been a lot of anger, anger and quite honestly, frustration when you consider that the coach's cap was installed just a couple of years ago. That already caused them to take cuts, and now the league is coming back to them again. There's a lot of angst among these scouts and coaches, general managers around the league, because they feel like they've already taken a cut, and now they're going to be asked to do more while making less. And the real issue here is, guys, and Roddy, you know through your time with the Riders that the lower-level people, the equipment guys, the staff that really help game day come together and even the franchise operate overall, those are the people that this is going to affect most. So from people that I've talked to around the league, they're really wanting to see, okay, what are the actual financials in terms of the accounting with these teams around the league? And is COVID-19 just a convenient excuse to try to squeeze some more of those at the bottom of the totem pole? Okay, so I'm glad you said that. Now, the term that I heard from people is that the CFL is top-heavy. And those guys, they're being called at the lower level, which they are and they know it. They're lower level of salary. They're almost, you know, they call them entry-level positions, but some guys have been doing them for 10, 15 years. The league's top-heavy with its salaries. All the money's being made at the top. And it doesn't look good. Doesn't look good to the fans. I don't think it'll look good to the federal government. Your report stated that presidents don't want to disclose their salary nor take pay cuts. Could you delve a little more into that and what you know? And yeah, I'm not exactly saying that the presidents need to disclose their salary, but their compensation isn't part of the football operations cap and neither is obviously randy ambrosi so there are general managers head coaches scouts assistant coaches out there that obviously can't speak while putting their name on it for obvious reasons they don't want to lose their job but that are saying well it's the commissioner the board of governors and the presidents that are putting this idea together and mandating it, that means that there was no choice. It was just something that they had to do. And they're making all of the money at the top, as you said, it's top heavy in that sense. And then they point to the league office and say, it's grown exponentially in terms of the number of bodies that are in there. And in some ways I understand it because you do need to try to market the game and get it out there and you need a sales team and all those types of things. But people will tell you that back in the 2000s, there was like 20, 25 people in the CFL office. Now, if you go down the roster, there's 70. And as you guys well know too, the scouting and coaching staffs are already skinny as it is in the CFL. So in the long term, maybe even heck in the short term, is this going to affect the level of play in the CFL? That would be poor for trying to affect or attract new fans. How could it not affect the level of play? I mean, seriously. But I talked about it on this show yesterday, wrote it in my recap that the CFL does have a credibility problem, and it's not because of the players and coaches. So why is that? It's because of the people making the decisions, these asinine decisions, by the way. Now, number one of my, to- my quick six show topics today was, is the CFL being too, or the Players Association being too hard on the CFL. You saw the term arrogant uh, in the letter that was sent to players by the Players Association yesterday. How would you answer that question? I don't think so at all. To be quite honest, the CFLPA has been pushed around in negotiations for too long, and they're not going to let that happen under the current regime led by Solomon Elamimi. And he's a tough physical linebacker on the field. And when they get in these discussions, I was about to say the boardroom, but it's going to be Zoom calls, obviously, to try to hammer out some sort of a COVID CBA if they try to get back on the field in 2020. But even a collective bargaining agreement going forward, I think, could look vastly different. At least that's what the CFL wants. So if you're a player, you're sitting there saying, well, just a year ago, the CFL agreed to raise the minimum salary to 65000 Now you're turning around 
and using the pandemic as a convenient excuse to try to saw us down. That's what the scouts and coaches feel like as well, that this is not necessarily just an issue derived because of what's happened with COVID-19, that it's a, a an easy time where they can sort of say, well, this is actually the reason. And that's what they're going to do is they're going to use the example of the football operations guys, and they're going to go to the players and say, look, we already cut four and a half million from our scouts and coaches. You guys need to go down too. And the players are not going to stand for it. They play 18 games, put their body on the line. And a lot of those guys are making in and around minimum salary. The average salary in the league is somewhere between 80 to $90,000. Not a lot of money for what their bodies go through. No doubt. And two years ago when that cap came in for the coaches, there was talk of a strike then. They never eventually did it. But I think the anger is at a level now where... It, it could happen. By the way, Lauren is watching. He is a coach in Pittsburgh. He says, for Justin, is it time for the league to consider going back to a truly Canadian league? In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it did pretty well with mostly Canadians playing. How do you feel about that model in an eventual CFL 3.0 that it's far less Americans than Canadians in this league? Well, it's interesting, but I would say that there's already a lot of Canadians in the league now, and you guys know this, on the rosters, you have to have on an active game day roster 21 nationals. So I think that, you know, they might look at it, can we get Canadians in maybe more of those skilled positions and give them opportunities? To me, that would be where you might want to look at. But, you know, I do think the Americans have really helped this league to play overall in this star power, whether we like it or not. When we talk about a number of names, whether it's free agency or the guys that are stars week in and week out, it's obviously the quarterbacks, but it's those guys in the skill positions too that come from the NCAA, and a lot of them have already a bunch of star power attached to them. I do think, though, that there are a number of Canadians that if given a similar opportunity, maybe they need a little bit more time to develop because they're not used to the level of play, that they could be productive as well if they were given the same opportunity so i mean i'm canadian i don't want to be biased i want to try to be balanced as a journalist but i don't think it would necessarily be a bad thing if more canadians were put in positions of prominence justin where do you stand on this and i won't keep you much longer but with the return to play it's you know there's this people have been talking about the questionnaire that went out to the players association by the union heads or the association heads it's, you know, are you willing to take less money? Are you willing to play on less time, rest? Your thoughts on maybe they do come up with a plan, but then the players reject it. You know, what are the, what are the chances of that? That's certainly possible because if the players aren't comfortable coming up to play an entire season while they're in a bubble city or even for a prorated salary, even if it's half, let's say. So let's use... An example of player X, most likely a quarterback that signed, Nick Arbuckle would probably be a good one. He got about $200,000 up front in a signing bonus. And is he going to come up here and risk his body and potentially his future to play half a season for a prorated salary that's going to be much smaller than that when he already has $200,000 in his pocket? The lower level guys and minimum salary guys I think would be all for it because they want to get film. But when you're talking about the upper echelon guys, mostly the guys that earn six figures or above that have already gotten some sort of a signing bonus or an early off season roster bonus, not a report and pass one before you would get to training camp. But those bonuses I think could make the leverage potentially in the player's favor, because if a lot of your stars are going to say, no, we're not doing it for that money then I think that actually gives the players a little bit of an upper hand. So I think that survey, as you alluded to, is going to tell a lot about the players and where they stand in terms of wanting to play. And the key is going to be for how much. No kidding. What else do you have for us today, Justin? Well, you mentioned the survey, so that's up. And the memo that just went out from the CFLPA, I think, is a potential big issue here. And I warned you guys and I've been telling people that I don't think the issue is going to be so much centered around, you know, can financially they get back on the field? I think it's going to be, can the players and the league office agree? So what we're going towards here and from what I'm hearing is that the league actually wants to reopen the entire collective bargaining agreement. If you can believe that they want a longer agreement 
So it's set in for the future, maybe four, five, or six years. But they're going to go after the salary structure. Now, I'm really curious to see what comes out of it in terms of the league trying to get more cost certainty. But that's something we're keeping a close eye on and tracking here as both sides get set for CBA negotiations in the middle of a pandemic. Canada's Adam Schefter is Justin Dunk, the ultimate CFL insider. Follow his stuff at 3downnation.com, your number one source for CFL info. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate it. Thanks, Roddy. Stay safe out there and enjoy the sim call. (laughs) Thank you. Will do. Thanks for watching in advance. Justin Dunk joining us uh, from 3downnation.com, the owner and operator of that site. You're watching Rod Peterson On Demand. For more of The Rod Peterson Show, visit rodpeterson.com or follow Rod Peterson on social media.